even before this pandemic, I understood that things have to change. We have to understand our time and we really have to understand our future because whatever we design today will be able to actually execute in the future. And that future is, is changing so, so fast. And it's a real issue. I mean, humans don't really like change. We are um, animals that don't like change. Uh, and, and the reason that I found my solution in space and in space innovation is that designing for space, one forces us to design for Earth's future because a lot of things, a lot of issues, if, if it's um, um, uh, square footage shortage or, or, or uh, pollution or, or anything like that, uh, that those are things that we're dealing with right now in space and it will be our problems or, or there will be bigger problems as we go in the future of Earth. And the second thing is designing in space forces us to think from first principles, forces us to think about the problems as if it's the first time we see it and we can't be attached to solutions that we are used to from Earth. So uh, those two things really help us kind of prepare for the future and understand how can we design and think about a future that uh, can sustain our lives even if we change uh, and even if technology changes. Uh, so, so regarding that, I think that's a big issue for me to understand that space is is not only something that is really in our future and we're really going to get there sooner than most people even imagine, uh, but also it's a really good way to solve problems here on Earth. Michelle Seisel is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Now, uh, I might have trashed or, or brutalized uh, uh, Misha's name, Michelle's name, but um, she's given me the honor to, to call her Mika throughout our podcast. But Mika is the founder of Zyso, a studio working at the intersection of architecture, innovation, space, and human equality. She is also a space architect focused on human experience, a trailblazer by dealing with social and psychological diversity aspects and an active member of Y Space, Israel Professional Women in Space Association, a visionary architect practicing for almost a decade in Israel and New York City. She has extensive experience in designing skyscrapers and large-scale urban projects. A graduate of the Technion Israel Institute of Technology, she also served in the Elite Intelligence Unit 8200 of the Israeli Defense Force. Taken together is a, uh, is a rare combination of creative skills, intelligence, data analysis, and technical abilities, which she manifests manifests as a space architect and thought leader. She is a two-time TEDx speaker, TEDx ISU, International Space University, Strasbourg, France, TEDx Yaffa Women, Tel Aviv, Israel, a frequent lecturer and mentor at academic institutions, organizations, and creative tech companies such as ISA, Israeli Space Agency, Ramon Foundation, UNOSA, which is United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, Explore Mars, Parsons School of Design, Wix, and much, much more. Mika is actively raising awareness for gender and human equality through public speaking, as well as collaboration with the international organizations such as UN Women, UN SDG Global, and SDG Israel. Zaiso was chosen uh, to be part of the UN SDG Action Campaign of 2019 as one of the top 10 global initiatives fighting for gender equality. As a mentor to young individuals, especially young women at various forms such as UNOSA, Space for Women, Pro-Woman Organization, and ISE, Israeli Startup Experience, Mika promotes courageous, creative thinking, innovation through extreme conditions and encourages all to become passionate change agents 
for this world. A proud activist and avid traveler, Mika inspired by cultures, diversity, and the various ways people use space on earth and beyond. Mika's mission is to create a built environment in space and on earth that fits the needs of its diverse users to ensure not only a surviving, but a thriving human society. Mika, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. It's such an honor to have you here. And we uh, know each other from, from uh, not only UNOSA, but also Space for Women and SDGs for Space. And, and, and our paths has kind of crossed before and you've uh, moderated or held chats or done some other things that have made my life easier, but also mm -hmm. kind of helped to promote me and, and given me some nice uh, feedback. And it's now very uh, an honor uh, to have you um, speak to us today and kind of tell us a little bit of deeper dive into your life and insights. So I'm so honored. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I can't wait. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to start off right away with a, with kind of the, the, the big bang, uh, obviously. It's uh, what's happened during this time at your, your bio was very detailed of what you've been doing and working on for such a long time. You're, you're an architect, but you're a unique type, type of architect doing some <clears throat> very futuristic, very spacey, very wonderful uh, projects and things and, and the way you think and, and your creativity um, and that wonderful aspect that's been missing, uh, the, 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 the female component of a lot of those for, for many years or has been suppressed, which I, I absolutely cannot stand and hate. Has any of that experience and that journey you've had up until now helped you to weather this pandemic? And how have you been? Give, give us an update how this crazy past year and this time has been and bring us up to speed where you're at. Yeah, um, I think that's a that's an interesting question. This This time has been very interesting for me. I think that um, the main thing that I understood before this pandemic that people should do, regardless of their profession, is try to become more agile, more flexible about what they do, uh, what they do in life, in their personal life, or in their careers. And I think that's something that I got really uh, comfortable with, just changing and going with the flow that once the pandemic hit, at least in the, in the career sense, I was still very comfortable. I did the immediate uh, switch from offline to online. Uh, my studio is actually a very new age architecture firm kind of thing that I don't really own a big office with a lot of workers. I uh, hire freelancers per project or I create build teams per project. And, and those teams are not even local. They're, they're all over the world. So in that sense, I was also much more prepared to kind of communicating uh, and doing projects online. And something interesting that happened to me that was that since the beginning of that pandemic, around April, I started a big project with a huge team in Italy in a location in the Nevada desert in the United States. Uh, and we kind of did all um, like eight months of work together, uh, communicating online and through Zoom. And it was very, very comfortable. And I think even for me, the international relationships became stronger because we used to have people saying, oh, when you come to Berlin or when you come to LA, let's grab a coffee. We'll, have, we'll, we'll uh, talk about the things that are interesting and common to us. But now, since we don't have that, the immediate thing is let's schedule a call for tomorrow. Um, so I think in that sense, my, my international connections and network got very, very, very strong. Um, so, so I really think that since I understood that I had to be flexible just when I thought about the future before this pandemic, because I really understand the fact that the world is changing exponentially. Every day, there's twice the amount of change of yesterday. So we really can't predict. So the only way for us to survive is kind of to be able to be flexible and to go with the flow and to change our titles and to not fall in love with our titles um, and, and really, really just see where the world takes us with um, curiosity and with excitement and not with fear and, and anxiety. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it, which, which was very interesting is since I, um, I, I design habitats or I, I research 
um, space habitats, and that are they are usually smaller physical spaces. Uh, there are I, I realize there are a lot of researches by NASA and other space agencies about how to cope with living in isolation and living in close quarters. Uh, so in the very uh, early days of the pandemic, I uh, I saw a colleague, another uh, space architect from LA, that she posted this thing about tips from space architects to living in isolation, and I kind of built on that and dove deeper into that and how can we take actual tips and tools from astronauts into actually living in isolation in our smaller homes and, and coping with other people. So those kind of two things uh, were really interesting for me. And I think it's been a very creative time. I, I believe that true creativity, true innovation comes from extreme situations. And, and this, is, this is good. <laughs> maybe, is. maybe think people would, would um, yeah, say to the contrary, but. No, it, it is fabulous. So and there, you know, just to, to clarify, the pandemic's a horrific time for everyone. It's, a, a, um, uh, it's bad. It needs to be taken seriously. And, and we're still not out of it. I mean, I guess we're in the second phase of lockdown in a lot of places and, and uh, still a lot of things have changed. But it's really sh shined the microscope on a lot of our problems. It's also let a lot of problems bubble to the surface that need to be fixed. And and I want to dive back into a couple of things you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, one that that our world around us, and if those who were her, who weren't listening clearly, is growing exponentially. Everything in our world is really growing exponentially, especially good, bad, and ugly is growing exponentially, uh, as well as the our us human beings are. Uh, the problem is, is we're really struggling in some respects to keep up with that exponential growth. And, and as human beings to our built environment, our infrastructures, our, the way we, we should be progressing towards the future is not keeping up with that day-to-day -day exponential growth. And so I love that you, you mentioned that and, and that, that you brought that out. I, um, I, I uh, have a good friend here in Hamburg, uh, Alexander Maria Fassbender. He uh, has a, uh, a company and a program organization and that uh, 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 is called Space Coach. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, to, to train people to be a space coach for those um, who are going to go to space, who are going to live on Mars because there's a lot, a lot of isolation, a lot of loneliness, a lot of mental and emotional um psychological issues that we deal with when we're leaving our home but also living and working and and doing things in harsh conditions that not just your physical body needs to be ready but your emotional mental state needs to be well to deal with that extra isolation and those moments of awe or overwhelming uh experiences that could be uh, experienced and there up until recent, there hasn't been a lot of efforts or, or um, you know, how is your mental state? And there's some programs on, on TV or some series out there where they've started to address that, which I really think is interesting, especially the one that's Mars, you know, kind of in conjunction with Elon Musk, where it goes to mm -hmm. present and then the future and, yeah. and things. They deal a lot with those psychological, emotional, uh, mental issues. Um, which I really find is interesting to be th to be thinking about. But the other thing that you touched upon that I, re I want, really want to address and point out is that um, a, a lot of us are not aware of how uh, space, future satellites, uh, going to Mars, going to the moon, anything to do with off this earth, how that has to do with a type of a work environment that is, is remote and coordinated with all sorts of players and actors around the world. And so most people who are in that are, are I don't think there's very many who are just say, oh, I'm just hyper-focused only on this one location. Most of them are coordinating with teams and players and producers and, and experts around the world to make sure that that project, that uh, mission or that certain thing can be executed and so not only as an architect but the, your other passions that you focused in you've 
probably have got it down to a science on how to work in teams, how to work remote, how to combat a lot of these issues. And I love that you brought all that out and, and your experience and you're looking amazing, like you're healthy and well and doing great. <laughs> and, and I think it's probably because your people are knocking down your door to, 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 to work and to, to uh, collaborate with you on some of the things that you're doing for our future. So I'm glad to hear that. And I, I don't know if you have any other thoughts or ideas that have popped into your mind when I kind of pointed out those things that you'd like to continue to address or maybe yeah. give us an example of a, of a super story that you've experienced during this time. I mean, I, th I think that you touched on the fact that, or you, you highlighted um, that I mentioned uh, exponential change. Everything that I do today, regard before, even before the pandemic, has to do with the fact that I realized, I looked around and I realized that things are not fitting, everything around us, products, buildings, architecture, cities, are not fitting our actual needs. There are a lot of things that we are kind of getting used to and we just accept as a given. Um, and I think when we uh, have things that are comfortable, like when we are healthy, we don't feel a problem, but when we, uh, are sick, then we start to see the problem. So I think for a, a lot of um, a lot of times, people that are minorities or 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 women or or people with disabilities, they feel um, the problems, uh, and and they a lot of times don't have the tools to change uh, or to create change or even to understand what the problem is. So even before this pandemic, I understood that things have to change. We have to understand our time and we really have to understand our future because whatever we design today will be able to actually execute in the future. And that future is, is changing so, so fast. And it's a real issue. I mean, humans don't really like change. We are um, animals that don't like change. Uh, and, and the reason that I found my solution in space and in space innovation is that designing for space one forces us to design for Earth's future because a lot of things, a lot of issues, if, if it's um, um, uh, square footage shortage or, or, or uh, pollution or, or anything like that, uh, that, those are things that we're dealing with right now in space and it will be our problems or, or there will be bigger problems as we go in the future of Earth. And the second thing is designing in space forces us to think from first principles forces us to think about the problems as if it's the first time we see it and we can't be attached to solutions that we are used to from Earth. So uh, those two things really help us kind of prepare for the future and understand how can we design and think about a future that uh, can sustain our lives even if we change uh, and even if technology changes. Uh, so, so regarding that, I think that's a big issue for me to understand that space is is not only something that is really in our future and we're really going to get there sooner than most people even imagine, uh, but also it's a really good way to solve problems here on earth. Um, so, so that's regarding the exponential growth. I think it's very important to, to kind of emphasize um, how we can really all do so much better and get so much better. Uh, and we just don't really know even to ask the question. So, so right now for me, it's kind of a process of doubting everything around me. Everything should be reconsidered. Um, I don't know if you want to dive into this now, but even the concept of, of countries, I think, should be reconsidered. Uh, there are many things that are not necessarily working for us right now and for, for humanity as it is right now. And it may have worked 100 years ago, but in kind of exponential growth scope thinking, that's a long time ago, 100, 100 years ago. A lot of things happened in the past 100, 100 years. Um, so, so that's one thing. And the other thing you mentioned is the world collaboration on projects. And, and I really think the ISS, the International Space Station is a good example for it. Uh, the ISS was starting to, uh, uh, the design process began in the uh, mid to late eighties. They started to assemble it uh, in the 90s and uh, astronauts actually started to live on it in, in, uh, uh, starting uh, 2000 and it was a global collaboration. I mean, 
the, the countries that had, uh, I don't catch me on, on the specifics here, but the countries that had the best, I don't know, solar panels, that's the one that they chose because that's just the best. So, and the ones that had the best communication technology, that's the one that, that helped on that. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting way to, to, to really collaborate. And, and I understand that I don't know everything and not necessarily the people that are around me, me like physically, geographically close to me are the best in, at something. So maybe it's okay to just branch out and, and understand that if you collaborate, especially if you collaborate with diverse people from different backgrounds, um, your product or your project will become so much better because you'll have so much more um, um, perspectives on it. So I really think this time kind of pushed us towards really understanding that. Uh, so there's so much that I can unpack and I kind of <laughs> want to unpack before we go into the, the next thing. And so I've, I've already got to take notes so that I don't, don't forget a few things that I want to ask you. Uh, we will get into um, the, the question you tickled in a minute. But first, you've you've kind of touched on uh, on a few things. So, um, one of the reasons I really love um, the idea of space is that it's uh, it's basically not only first principles thinking, but it's also closed systems thinking, which is circular economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really like that model for here on Earth. But it's the true test of resilience and uh, sustainability and to be able to sustain oneself for a while. If we're thinking about, you know, the ISS, for example, that you mentioned as um, it's a closed system, it's confined, it has certain technologies. But if, if you were to try to, you know, and they've done many experiments and things there, if you do something in those environments uh, to, to grow a plant or to, to do cellular agriculture or try to, you know, uh, produce algae or something there, that the inputs or the way that you create that process within minutes can be felt if you were to try to use chemicals or certain things that in a closed system would, mm -hmm. would come to light very quickly and could come back and, and damage the air or damage the astronauts or, or something, you know, an explosion could occur. So those things need to be thought out very well before beginning any of that process. That's why not right. only is there the collaboration, but there's this pre-planning and thinking. This is, this is a very interesting thing that you're mentioning. I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off, but- No, go ahead. It's kind of like a, a microcosmos of what we have here. I mean, doesn't that mean that every action that we do has a reaction or has an impact. I mean, we feel that since we are in, on Earth and Earth is big and limitless kind of, uh, or that's how we feel or how we behave, our actions don't have immediate uh, uh, impacts, but actually exactly like what can happen in small quarters like on the ISS, everything that we do, it doesn't matter if it's small or, or big, um, has an immediate impact. So I think that kind of thinking to get used to that kind of thinking is something that is very useful <laughs> for us here. It's beautiful. It's the most useful ever. The, 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 I think that you touched upon it uh, uh, succinctly. And the reason why it's harder for us to think in that way here on earth or, or for us to act upon it or to apply that into our life is because we're on a much bigger spaceship earth. And, and uh, so the effects take years, you know, 10 or 30 years sometimes to see those effects of things that we put in our atmosphere or our oceans or, or whatever into our little ecosystems, even in certain areas um, takes us a lot longer. And so, because we're kind of a linear and, and have trouble thinking and, and complexities and kind of siloed thinkers as human beings, it's hard to say, oh, by doing this, uh, that's going to create this ripple effect because it's not as immediate. Whereas in the ISS and in these closed, smaller, it, it can happen within minutes to hours mm -hmm. that, that, you know, they're seeing their thing. And they are also operating on some other systems that are also going on here on Earth, but in a different method where that air is being recycled and repurposed and the, when they go to the bathroom and when they urinate and some of those mm -hmm. things are being recycled, repurposed and make sure that that waste is uh, not becoming a piled up waste that somehow that's recycled or, or, or exchanged. Um, 
in this, again, circular economy system, closed loop systems, um, which, which I think is fabulous. And so I'm sure you, uh, as we go on today, you're going to kind of tell us how we can apply those in better ways in, in our built environments and here on earth and, and some other uh, experiences on that. One thing that I, I, I'm not sure was addressed 100 years ago or addressed back uh, uh, 51 years ago when we were starting to, to think about going to space and the moon and, and our rockets. And I see it coming to light more and more. And that is the livability factor of living in space, uh, even traveling in outer space, but also living on the moon, living on Mars. Um, and when we talk livability, it's the social cultural aspect of that, the emotional, mental, the psychological aspect of that livability, which we didn't used to talk about that a lot, but that's a big factor because we're social beings and we have this, we, we, especially now during this pandemic, we've all seen, okay, this is our human zoo. I don't like it. I've created the wrong human zoo. I don't want to be here more than 12 hours because I'll pull my hair out or, you know, that's happening a lot in a world, more domestic violence or more frustration with your kids because you don't have enough technology or internet broadband to help educate them now if they stay home, et cetera, et cetera, that we really, uh, in a lot of respects, we've separated work and, and livability or our, our personal lives from each other. And they're almost diverging poles. They're almost pulling in the separate directions against each other. And we really need to think about combining those in this livability and this new way of doing it. So um, I'm sure you're gonna get into how, when, when you deal with these, these things, uh, uh, built environment and space and even on earth, how you factor those livability things into which are really emerging, or maybe you have some other terminology or thoughts on how that works. Yeah, um, I think that's a big question. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, uh, I think another thing that now as you were speaking, uh, I, I, I realized that I was doing even before the pandemic is I understood that one, I like what I do. For, for, for money, <laughs> for work. Um, but that's not something that is separate for my, I can't really separate it from my personal life. So instead of fighting it, I decided that I will create my schedule seven days a week. Every day I'm working, but every day I'm doing something for me that doesn't have anything to do with work and I'm kind of balancing it out and it's not strict. I can have weekends off, I can have whatever days I want off. But I, I took all of my seven days and divided them uh, for work and, and, and life. I also realized that I work better or my creativity or my creative juices run higher at night, 11 p.m., that's my creative hour. So I organized my life for, uh, around me being able to work. I mean, I, I chose an office that is not scary at night. Unfortunately, that's a factor that mostly women uh, take into consideration because I knew that I had to, I want to be in the office really late at night until 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., because this is when I work my best. Um, and it also really works well with working internationally. Uh, so, so once I understood that, and I think I implemented that into, that into my life, that helped me during this uh, time, because really I understand that we have to think about not um, uh, living for working, and, but also not working for living. It's something that is, is bigger than that. We have to understand the impact of our architecture, our immediate environment, our homes, our offices on the way we behave. Do we have enough air? Do we have enough light? Do we have our own personal space? Like uh, on the ISS, the astronauts have like those little tiny pods that the, when they wanna get away, it, it's something that is crucial to have. And a lot of um, families with small children found that they don't have those personal spaces and those boundaries really got um, kind of uh, uh, blurred. And, and, and I think another thing is that every person is very unique. I mean, in the same family, you can have a parent, regardless if it's a mom, a dad, two moms, two dads, each of them and the children, they can have different needs. They feel better with this amount of hours in their communal space area in the house. Or, I mean, uh, every person has different needs, even if they're so uh, much alike within the same core family. So just imagine how it is with people that are unrelated, 
never met each other and are stuck in a place together uh, for a long duration of time. And that place is kind of small. Um, so that leads me to, to, the th to the second thing is that really um, um, understanding that we have different needs. It doesn't mean, um, it's like if, if you call um, people with differences of abilities, when you call them disabilities, their disabilities are disabilities because the world around them doesn't allow them to, to function like everyone else. If everything around us was fit for wheelchairs, people with wheelchairs are not disabled people. They're able to do everything. Um, uh, and people on wheelchairs is something that's very visible to us. But everyone have different needs and different abilities and our world should fit that. Um, and, and so I, I really think that's another thing that was very, very apparent and, and something that I, it was interesting for me to kind of portray and, and, and to talk about and to research um, um, more now in this time because people really started to get what I'm talking about. Uh, so, so that's, yeah. I love to hear that and that's beautiful. I, I, I really, and I'm sure you do as well, um, I, I don't ha have the separation of of work and life. I also work seven days a week, but I don't see it as work. I really enjoy what I do. I enjoy in our conversation now. I enjoy uh, the people I get to meet, the books I get to read, the the projects and the work there. And, and if I don't enjoy them, I usually don't take them on. I don't take them on because I know that I will be frustrated and I will feel like it's uh, uh, the, uh, the four letter word work and, and it, <laughs> it won't make fun. And my best work is when when I'm passionate or I feel like it's my company or my baby and I'm going to do the best I can and, and that my skills can come out and shine. Now, not, not everyone has the, the fortunate ability to do that. I think that if our working environment, our organizations in the world would take more of that uh, human factor in, into consideration and the future of work and how we work and how we set our, not just our work hours, but how we, um, set up the future of work for our employees that not only will a company or the organization be more efficient that the uh, employee satisfaction would go up we know for a fact that it's above i think 78 percent in the world now of, of dissatisfaction with with our work and jobs we just do it for a paycheck and uh, a lot of that lies on the working conditions and the structure of that organization. And that's also part of the built environment. It's part of the way that that organization is, is set up. And, and um, during this time of the pandemic, again, that micro lens has been shown in on, on that, that people are in the reports are saying, boy, a lot of these organizations, they don't need an office space at all. That's just been a big waste of monies and, mm -hmm. and time that our employees can be just as efficient from home. But then there's the other factor that now, uh, how is that person's home environment livable or has the ability to have a separate office or it has the tools to, to work from home? And so I don't want to get too far into that, but there's a lot of things that if, if even organizations that are very labor intensive or very kind of uh, industrial where you have to physically go and it might not be the most wonderful, that there are ways to make that enjoyable for your employees and, and in return, it only benefits those human beings. And I'm sure you deal with that as well. Do you want to say something yeah. before I yeah, move to the next question? This kind of ties back to your uh, question before that about uh, livability um, and, the liv and, and the concept of livability in space. Um, if we, uh, space until a few decades ago, maybe less, uh, wasn't about living in space. It was about conquering new realms and, and, and about science and about exploration. It was never about actually living there. Um, and now kind of the conversation changed. It's uh, the difference between old space and new space. Um, and, and we understand that we may need a backup for humanity. Uh, and also we can really uh, find more areas to kind of settle as part of our like basic instinct of, 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 uh, of spreading around. Um, and, and technology now allows us to do that. But even if we look at the International Space Station, it wasn't designed for living. It was designed for working and it was designed for 
uh, it was designed by uh, very or, or not so diverse people uh, in times where the majority of the people and they're still it's still true today but in smaller numbers the majority of the space industry are um, uh, white male abled straight um, uh, like the same type typecast um, and you can really see how right now even the most technologically advanced structure in the entire world looks like the inside of a computer. Uh, it's really hard to change it. I mean, they began to, they're living in 2020, astronauts in 2020 are living in something that was designed in the eighties. And it looks like that. It was, it's not designed for all types of astronauts all body sizes or backgrounds. Um, it's not designed for maximizing their um, productivity. Uh, the fact that it looks like the interior of a computer and it's like there are wires everywhere and it's very not it's not not so um, visually uh, clean impacts the way they perform and and I think now it's hard to change it because it's a, it was such a huge effort to build but always thinking balancing that question of of what's urgent and what's important and understanding that the important is not less than the urgent. <laughs> I mean, the urgent is to survive, to breathe, to, to, you know, to not get, not die from radiation. But the important stuff of, of being productive, being able to focus, being able to rest, being able to, to communicate, those things are as crucial um, for a sustainable future or for sustainable living. Yeah. Um, and, and those things kind of circle back to everything that you just mentioned about the offices and the homes and, and how we think about this space that we design and what is going to be used for and all the possible options. Uh, so, so I really think that kind of really ties, ties together. Oh, I absolutely know it does. And, and I, uh, there's been numerous examples and, and um, of how not to do it in the past and uh, learning experiences. One of my good friends and mentor, William McDonough built a city in China that was a big, huge failure because it didn't address the livability of the farmers it was designed for. They moved in and uh, they're like, we need to be closer to the farm and we don't want to be here. And we use our, 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 the way we live a lot different. And it was a, a huge learning experience and, uh, of how important livability and that work-life balance is and how those two really sometimes they're seen as different and they're pulling in different directions, but they're not. The, 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 all the discussions of the future of work, the future of, of how we do things, those things are uh, combined into a lifestyle, into livability. They're part of your life. And I think the job satisfaction or the career enjoyment, the enjoyment of life period, if those two worlds are in harmony or one, how much better our world would do. Uh, and, and this year has been a fabulous example. I mean, we, I, I, I hate to keep dwelling on what we've been on, but you, there's so many wormholes that we can go into in reality. So uh, historical precedence, first time in 11 years now that uh, we've had our own private uh, uh, missions, you know, the Dragon Falcon X uh, go multiple times now to the ISS delivering equipment, launching Starlink broadband and, and uh, first manned mission to, to go uh, not through Russia to, to the ISS. And the difference from the old shuttle cockpits and or the old cockpits to the now more livable, more comfortable, easy, less chaos in, in those cockpits and we've seen that shift and I hope that shift carries on now to the ISS and carries on to many other things that we're moving more in that direction. I just feel it, I see it, uh, everything there. And it's such a, it's a different thing. When I used to watch the old Apollo or the other missions, I'd like, how in the hell can they remember what buttons, when, what to do? There's so many, uh, ways for error but also how can you just not um mentally be overwhelmed by seeing that because it's not a job uh, as you also mentioned it's not a job that is um can be turned off they say okay i've worked eight hours i'm going to go home there that's a 24 7 for multiple days or months sometimes mm -hmm. 
um, that they're living that and they've always almost always got to be on. So that's where the nice part of livability or functionality uh, mm -hmm. really comes into play. So uh, all those things you brought out so eloquently, I just had to to touch upon them. Um, the my real first big question is, how do you do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without borders, nations, divisions of humanity, one that was truly biodiverse and, and um, open for all of us? Uh, what are your thoughts or feelings? How do you yeah. feel about that? Well, I'll, I'll share with you a personal story. Um, I, in terms of global citizen, uh, ever since I was young, I moved around with my parents around the world. So the first time I moved was when I was 12 years old and we moved from Israel to New York. Um, and then we moved back when I was 15 and then I moved to Italy and then I moved back and then I moved to New York again and then I moved back. And every time I moved, it was like my whole life moved with me and, my, and the last time I was in New York, I got rid of all of my belongings, went like the story, like with four suitcases full of books, by the way, nothing more practical than that. Um, I kind of decided that this is where I'm going. And, and the reason I came back to Israel had to do a lot with the, the elections in 2016, but we will not get into that. Um, but, but as a person that traveled a lot from a very young age, I had the privilege to play with identity with um, culture, cultural identity, with how I present myself to the world, how, what I, who, who I choose my, to, to be my friends, um, what I want to do. So that kind of thing about a global citizen is something that I, 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 I had or I, I, I experienced since a very young age. But I think what you're more referring to is really the reason that now we are collaborating and working. I, I work with people from literally all over the world um, on every continent. And, and I think that's something that I, it's not only amazing and interesting to see and to, to know those people. And also when I lived in New York, when I was younger, I studied in an international school of kids, of diplomats. So I was always around people from all over the world. Um, so I think that's very, very interesting. It's also very humbling and it, it makes you feel smaller <laughs> uh, in a good way. Um, people have so many things, uh, cultures and, and, and different things that, that are happening and you're not necessarily aware of. But also um, I, I think that I got to understand and maybe it's a bit radical, but the fact that we are born into a specific country doesn't necessarily nowadays, is it helpful for us or does it kind of hold us back? Um, I think now people can relate globally on topics that their countries that they are coming from are not necessarily agreeing on. I think that taxes, healthcare, religion, all those things are not necessarily something that we all choose to, to have or we are all agreeing with in our countries. And a lot of times that kind of prevents us from, from communicating or working with people that are from other places that are different than ours. And this time kind of broke down those barriers a little bit. Um, and I really do think, I mean, if, if, I, if I'm thinking about architecture and I'm thinking, is it relevant to us, the infrastructure, the roads? I mean, you know that, you know, do you know, I'll ask you a question. Do you know why our roads are the, the width that they are almost the same all around the world? <laughs> Do you know why? I don't what know. the, the I size? Don't know. So so a long time ago, people used horse and carriage, and the dimension of the carriage was the dimension of two horses' butts, basically. And then the roads were paved for those carriages. And then the 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 the, the our roads today were paved a lot of times based on those dimensions. Um, so today construction, like pieces of glass for skyscrapers when you are not producing them on site and you have to um, um, bring them to the site from the factory. Those pieces of glass are, are limited by the size of the truck and the truck is limited by the size of the road and the road is limited by the size of the carriage and the carriage is limited by the size of the two butts of the horse. 
and we kind of stuck with it. And I think the same concept go, and, and I think maybe, maybe our roads need to have, I don't know, completely different dimensions. Maybe we need to drive around in square cars and not rectangular cars. Maybe that would be more effective for us. Um, so, so the same kind of thought process, I, I started to think about countries. I mean, okay, it was good for us back then in, in the past, uh, we needed like the same idea goes for, for marriage, for, for, you know, to control people, to put them in confined borders, just to, to be able to control them uh, and to control the country and to control the economy. But maybe it's not relevant anymore. And I think you need a lot of courage or, or the reason, the other way around, the reason that people are not doubting it so vocally is because we have a lot of ego. We are scared um to to change those things and we are scared of things that are long-term change because maybe we will not be able to see the results personally so what's the point um so, so i really think that it's a new time where where before this pandemic a lot of things happen under underneath the surface just a small amount of people around the world kind of noticed it and now everything like you said bubbled up uh, and, and we see everything and all, and everything that is bad that we believe that we are shouldn't consider and, and, and we're going in the right direction or something. And now we're saying that we are wrong and we have to, to own it and, and, and to really understand that change is needed does, regardless of the fact that if we will be able to benefit from it or not. Um, I don't know how I got to this from from my global <laughs> non-border thing, but I, but I really think that uh, to your question, yes, I, I consider myself a global citizen, and I even would like to see a future or a time where it's actually true that it's actually borderless or kind of yeah, connecting right. with people based on your passions, based on your interests, and not based on other things. I can tell you my take why I think you got there um, and it makes perfect sense to me, but maybe that's because I have this crazy uh, uh, mind, but um, it's, uh, you started out with the asses of horses. So it's a kind of asinine mm -hmm. principle that we've created boundaries or borders based off of the asses of horses, which limit us to the size of what we can use for buildings, which is another form of a border or division based on originally how we started uh, mobilization, how we started transportation, um, which is, you know, so when I talk a lot about sustainable development, you know that, and um, what, it, what it is, is infrastructure. It's infrastructure for the future. It's one that sustains us. It continues to grow and evolve. Uh, hopefully exponentially or uh, keeping up with the future. But that infrastructure is uh, so important that it grows with humanity, that it is up to speed with the, the built environment, with livability, with the way we do things. I went to uh, Songdo, Korea for the Resilience Frontiers workshop for the United Nations to create the roadmap from 2030 to 2050. And Songdo, Korea was supposed to be the first smart um, city, city right. and, and uh, you know, be very innovative and stuff. And, and there's a lot of wonderful things there. It's a beautiful place. I loved it. They ate like a king, but it was all designed around roads and cars. And uh, they have these big, you know, four or five lane roads and they're all empty. There's hardly any traffic. And it's like a uh, it's a ghostless, a soulless uh, uh, place built around these roads. And um, we need to be flexible enough to, to grow with the future, to, to develop our infrastructure and not build around um, old ways of thinking, cars or, or whatever, that we build around the livability of humanity about beautiful, resilient, desirable futures because yeah, it's kind of like this. Uh, you look back and you say, oh, boy, and, uh, if you're a visitor from outer space, whoa, look at these big roads. I guess uh, the, the main inhabitants are cars or what, you know, it's it's not mm -hmm. for human beings who and species and our planet who it's really made for. And so we need to integrate that a little bit more But that. Uh, um, uh, you know, brings me to uh, tons of different ideas that, that we could go off on, on as far as 
what you discussed on being a global citizen and, and uh, how we work. I really see our planet, our earth, you know, this is a map, but I see us as uh, all crew members, team members uh, on spaceship earth. And I'm a big fan of Carl Sagan. His daughter, Sasha Sagan, was on my podcast. And, and um, Carl Sagan, I quote quite a bit. And he says, uh, has said that um, we are all star stuff. We're all stardust. And it's absolutely true. The basic elements of life, the elements in our body, are the same that are in the interiors of collapsing stars. They're the same elements that our earth is made up of, the core elements, this first principle thinking as well uh, of our earth. But we all crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth. We are earth beings, we are earthlings. We are all unified together. Nobody was dropped off on planet Israel or planet Germany or planet USA uh, or Venus or Mars. We all crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth. And uh, Carl Sagan also said it very eloquently. There's this rising consciousness that the earth um, is seen as one single organism. And an organism divided amongst itself is doomed we need to embrace the biodiversity of our organis organism and realize we crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth and we're all homo sapiens and learn how to li live uh, in harmony as part of symbi this symbiotic earth. And, and uh, things will go so much more beautifully for us and humanity and, and our, 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 our future livability that we will just the success and, and the happiness will be off the charts and i i'm so glad that uh uh you know you're here and you know very well carl sagan and these these thoughts and these uh, these discussions but i really want to dive a little bit deeper because i know this is an important part of you and who you are besides of of what you do as an architect there's a big aspect of diversity and gender equality and your thoughts or feelings. And um, I always say that uh, the two top ways to draw down our human suffering and environmental problems on this planet earth is to empower women and girls and gender equality, diversity has a lot to do with that. But I would like you to elaborate more and tell, tell us maybe your journey of how this became uh, a livability, a passions project and what you've done and, and kind of your, your thoughts around this as well. Um, yeah, um, it is a big part of, of what I do and, and kind of to tie to what uh, you uh, said about Carl Sagan, um, Frank White uh, coined the term, the overview effect. Um, and he said that something shifts in our perspective when we see the earth from space and we see that everything is one big organism. And I don't know if people know the ISS circles the earth 16 times a day. That means that they sometimes are able to see changes, natural changes happening in front of their eyes. They're able to see clouds forming and the wind taking those clouds and rain falling on a different continent in within one like you know loop around the earth so so i think that concept is something that now people are feeling with this pandemic because we're all in the same boat uh and for me personally talking about gender equality i mean women are 50 49 51 <laughs> depending on the day percent of the population um it's not that i think that uh, they are um, more important than other groups or genders or, or, or other group, minority groups, but I think they're just a very, very big chunk of the population. And for me personally, my journey about that kind of began or, or I kind of realized it more when I was living in New York, doing really, really big projects. I was senior architect of an architecture firm in, in, in New York, uh, working on an 80 story building in Fifth Avenue and, and really, really crazy projects. And I was always the only woman in the, in the room and not to mention the only woman in the construction site. 
uh, always when I come to construction sites, even from the time that I was studying architecture, people always say like, little girl, what, what are you looking for here? Like, are you here to make us coffee? Like what's happening? Like, are you, are you, are you shoes like the right shoes for this construction site? Um, and, and I really saw that I, I, I'm always the only one. I'm always treated differently. And, and it kind of led me to, to understand that this must have an impact on other things besides the way I'm feeling. Um, the, the fact that I'm always the only one in the room, the only woman, means that the majority of the world around us was designed by men. Um, and even if they have the best intentions, they just don't know things that, or, or, or needs that women have. And I think kind of having that aha moment and understanding that shifted everything for me and for uh, as far as what I do with architecture because I, I it became my mission to kind of create a world or, or even to raise the flag and for people to just be aware that everything around them is not best fit for them but I when I started to talk about architecture and gender equality the developers that I was working with they're the big shot developers they're all men obviously. And, and they were really shy away. They used to like not, not like to talk about this topic. And people warned me, like, don't, don't say that this is what you're dealing with because you will lose work. You will lose jobs. You will lose projects. Um, so I kind of started to, to, to try to find a way how to go about this without blaming anybody, without pointing fingers. And I really think that that's the key to everything. That's the key to, 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 to climate change, like to, to, to working around that. Um, I, I saw a really nice um, quote that says, don't blame a clown for, for acting like a clown. Ask yourself why you keep going to the circus. Um, so kind of the, the way that I started to, to talk about this was, okay, there is this future. This future is in space, on Mars, far away from here. Um, this future doesn't exist yet. Uh, we have to create it. And this is why it's going to be better for everyone if this future would be equal, not gender, humanity uh, 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 wise. Uh, and, and I started to kind of break it down with how you would benefit from having ev everyone happy or having a, like benefit in terms of money, in terms of efficiency. Um, and, and once I was able to prove that an equal future, sometime in, 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 somewhere far away from here, doesn't have anything to do with you, your brother, your father, you're all fine, you're all are awesome. <laughs> Nobody's done anything bad. And I really think that nobody's done anything bad. I think our consciousness evolved and, and things just changed around us. And, and people, women didn't have rights. Uh, at all, like how how can you design a, a, an urban environment for women if women weren't the people using that space? The place for a woman was at home. That's just was the reality. There's no point of wasting time and blaming. I think to to kind of shift the way we even say what the problem is is part of the solution. So if we can prove financially that it's better, um, psychologically that it's better, mentally that it's better, and to talk in general terms and talk about the future and talk about opportunities and not problems, um, how we can take this as an opportunity to make things better and not to solve a problem that if there's a problem that means that somebody is in charge of that problem or somebody is to blame for that problem. I think that's something that really helps um, um, to, to think about those things. So right now, even though I really focus on, on mentoring young uh, girls and young women to go into STEM and STEAM um, and, and to kind of empower them and encourage them, I really try to, to make it even broader. And, and it's not just gender equality, it's human equality. Um, I, I also take it to, to my latest research is about how different abilities here on earth become superpowers in space. Um, so kind of shifting all, again, the, 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 the way we think about uh, people that are blind or their vision is impaired here on earth, maybe in space, there's something that is called space blindness. When a person uh, is in space for a long duration of time, their eyesight um, gets impaired. So maybe blind people would not have the mental 
impact of getting blind while in space on a mission, maybe they could be even better astronauts. Um, and, and I kind of divided it into different kinds of, of, of abilities, mental, sensory, and physical, and, and kind of to shift the, the, the blame game um, and to shift, like, even if we talk about climate, um, cars that are polluting, um, uh, factories that are polluting, and, and trying to point fingers, just try to prove as if we are pitching for investors, why is this important to, to invest in this idea and really try to look at things in a different way to change the terminology. That is so beautiful. <laughs> that, there's really nothing, I mean, more that I can say about that. And I know you're doing a lot more than that as well, but you're a great voice and advocate around that. Um, I just had a podcast not too long ago, I think it was, came out uh, last week or the week before with uh, Professor Dr. Jenny uh, yes, C. Yes. Stephens, which is really good. She wrote a book, Diversifying Power, Why We Need Anti-Racist Feminist Leadership on Climate and Energy. And uh, the the stories that she has is just amazing. And, and I've... I've I've kind of stalked you online. I've seen your your TED Talks and I've uh, seen what you do. And I know you're a strong advocate for that. I really believe we need more of that. And that shift uh, in the future is really one that will change how humanity um, survives and sustains itself well into the future, that we get that diversity, that we change the playing field, we raise the global operating system and the bar higher that we're, we're not dealing with some of these petty small things that we're dealing across the world uh, with a lot of us. Now, uh, at, the, at the beginning, you kind of mentioned you're not going to say why you moved in 2016. We know it's <laughs> Trump, and I, I don't have a, a, a problem at all talking about that asshole because he is uh, such an idiot, uh, um, uh, you know, is a, but that that idiot has done a lot of positive things to show us what are all the problems are in our world and what's wrong and how when humanity divides itself uh, uh, amongst itself, uh, even the United States, whether it's Democrat or Republican or crazy Oompa Loompas and uh, the rest of the world is just putting a black eye on humanity and where we really need to go for the future. And it's uh, almost criminal behavior what, what uh, is going on, which is delaying humanity from reaching that beautiful, desirable future. So the delays and the, the wasted time and the fake news and all the drama has just put us off on, on really reaching that goal where we need to go as humanity to unify ourselves for a better future. And so I hope that uh, uh, even for the, the Trump followers that, the, that that has come and been very clear that, that uh, they're a very small minority uh, among the rest that are dividing themselves from the rest of humanity for us on this spaceship earth to, to get to a beautiful future instead of uh, unifying ourselves with some better operating systems, some better models for everyone. Um, I really think though that yeah. Trump is, like you said, is a gift in disguise, kind of, because really things were bad before him. Uh, and in order for a change, something really big had to happen. I think Trump is the first thing and the pandemic is the second thing. Uh, and, and we are all now suffering from it, but I think that's how growing pains feel. Uh, and it's kind of a pendulum that it begins with extremes until we kind of settle in a comfortable place in the middle. So, so I really agree that as much as he represents almost all that is bad in the world, um, and I think he brought up the conversation of, of, of leadership, of, of um, uh, setting an example well, of how, of not how to do it. yeah, yeah, or, or yeah. How, what do you expect? I mean, uh, you can talk, talk about that about him or about other world leaders. Those people not necessarily would get a job as a security guard. <laughs> in a yeah. mall, um, yeah. but, but they get the, the highest positions in the world. Uh, I really think, I mean, when Trump was elected, uh, The Handmaid's Tale uh, started that uh, series based on, on, on a book written in the 80s. 
I think, or even before that. Um, and it was so relevant and I really felt um, that that future that is portrayed in the, in the, in the um, uh, series is something that could actually happen. This is literally something that could actually happen to us if nothing big is going to change. And it kind of all happened together. And I think that's not by, chain, by chance. I think our universe is kind of letting us know that something really, really big and bad has been happening and we have to change things. But I really do think that it's helpful not to point not 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 to like to to point fingers or to to not to waste we don't have a lot of time so we don't have yeah. to waste time uh uh about thinking who did the worst or who uh contributed to to the situation uh to the bad situation and really start thinking about about how can we uh solve this and i think that's kind of a way of thinking an optimist way of thinking that is really helpful. I mean, there's no, it's kind of like Elon Musk is saying about the future of humanity in space as a uh, interplanetary species. And he says that thinking about a future that is not interplanetary species, uh, humans are not inter interplanetary species is just depressing. So, so really a lot of things that we should do is just start from that perspective because it can really bring people down. I think this time has been, um, uh, it's easy to, to get frustrated and angry and, and, you know, I believe it. Yeah, no, I, I I'm full alignment with you and uh, we need to use, use it for good. Uh, that brings me to an interesting question. So you were just on a, on an event in an event with Elon Musk. So I don't know if it was on the same panel or, or if you guys got to speak, but you were like uh, back to back on, uh, on the same event, which, which is uh, pretty cool. Your part was very cool, but that Elon uh, to to be on there with Elon Musk that says a lot to what stature and what level you're at as well um, for my listeners. But how how was that? Can you tell us anything interesting about that? I mean that that's just crazy. I mean that was um, I, I didn't get to talk to him, uh, especially because he he was supposed to be on like the rest of us on uh, on Zoom. It was supposed to be a physical. Uh, actual convention in, in Washington. <clears throat> it was first scheduled to be in May of 2020, and then it was postponed to September of 2020, and then it became, I'm sorry, <clears throat> and then it became uh, an online event, and Elon had to fly to Germany for like a Tesla crisis or something last minute, so he did his interview by phone, and um, I, I later found out that he was actually walking around a castle, <laughs> talking on the phone to us for like 20 minutes. So I didn't really act, uh, get to, to uh, meet him and talk to him, uh, but I've been preparing for that moment, which will happen uh, for, for a few years now. Uh, I think this whole thing, everything that I do now in, in, in the space industry, and also in the, the quality diversity aspects is things that I learned myself um, I only have a bachelor's degree in architecture, although I studied five years and in Europe it qualifies for master's, but, but uh, by Israeli standards, that's, that's only um, bachelor's. Uh, and, and it's just insane to me that this is where I'm, I'm at and I'm not even in the beginning, I mean, just in the beginning. Um, but, but really everything that I, I do, I, I kind of, learned as I go. And, and I think that kind of really, that, that really helped me to, to progress and to have a big network of, of, of collaborators and, and partners and friends that I didn't really know where I'm, I still don't really know where I'm going with this. Um, I still don't really know what my goal is. And I think that's part of the, that, that, that's what helps me to be so um, flexible uh, with my unique path. Uh, so, so being on that um, uh, event, which was by Explore Mars, it was called Humans to Mars Summit, and not only Elon Musk was on there, but Charles Bolden, who was the former NASA administrator, who I had the pleasure of meeting twice already in Israel, and he's an amazing, amazing person, and I talked to him about diversity in the space industry, uh, which was incredible. Uh, and, and a lot of other amazing astronauts were on in that convention, so it's a... Uh, sometimes I can't believe that that's 
that I got to do that. And it's a, a real honor and, and privilege and, and really is helping me to, to, is giving me the platform to talk about these things that I personally never heard anyone talk about. Um, and and kind of right now, and uh, the way I go about things is uh, everything is possible. I, I don't know if you heard, there's this going to be um, a second Israeli astronaut or tourist to the uh, International Space Station, and he is actually self-funding his journey. Um, and it's very, very expensive to go uh, to space, and, and he has the money, and, and there was a big, like, shout out by like all the women in in the uh in israel the women that are in the space industry and why the second astronaut is a man and if he's funding himself do we have another woman that can find fund herself uh, uh to go to space and and that kind of led us to, to to discussing it and thinking who is that potential woman that can go to space uh the, the first israeli female astronaut and and out of nowhere I found myself in a position that it, it, may, it may be me in, in a few years. And it's actually something that I'm considering, people around me are considering. And, and that's something that may may as well happen. And, and then I got to think maybe it's not a matter of when, it's, uh, uh, it, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of, of when. Um, so I, I really think that really going with the opportunities you're given and not um, everything that you do is on the expense of something else that you don't do, that you don't do, and kind of going with that and just seeing how things progress and and when things are right, kind of the universe is telling you that, that it's right. So so that uh, meeting uh, or convention with Elon Musk on it was really a a point of 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 me being able to say this is crazy, but I guess I, something I did something right here. Uh, um, that I got this opportunity. Um, um, I and, love that. Um, yeah, I think there, there are yeah. so many wonderful things there. And I, I mean, I have a lot of friends in Israel and I advise a bunch of companies in Israel and, and one of them is a left farms. But um, my uh, friends that are there, a majority of them are, fi are female. And they that's one unique thing about Israel is that all uh, females, uh, serve in the military so not only they they have that um, kind of boot camp the training the experience the fortitude mm -hmm. the physical abilities but they also learn some amazing skills that really make israeli women are, are strong strong women powerful and um uh have that aspect there so i'm sure there's tons of candidates but i could not think of a better one than you, I think you'd be, you'd be great. So you, I'm rooting for you. Thanks, um, but, but yeah, that's, that's fabulous. I, I think that's a, that's also a, for me in some respects. So gender equality, diversity, um, you know, this, this equality uh, as well uh, as that, that that's seen and different in a lot of places. It's, it's really a forerunner. Another thing is Israel, in some respects, is also kind of a circular economy. It's a closed environment in some respects, the way they produce yeah, that's... and do things. It's very resilient. It's very, um, the way they do it in minimal and efficient spaces, I, I think, is, is a world leader. I eat, uh, or I have in the past, I don't anymore, but I eat it in the past, uh, you know, asparagus and potatoes from 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 Israel and, and a lot of the vertical farming and controlled environmental agriculture do amazing things uh, that I deal with uh, from Israel. So uh, uh, yeah. I, I, mean, I really things. think that Israel, th those things that you're mentioning about Israel, I mean, if you think about it, the reason that we have the military, the reason that we are forced to progress technologically, agriculturally is extreme extreme situation that we have here. We are surrounded by enemies. Uh, we are um, um, in the desert basically, and we had to create grow stuff in the desert. Um, we need the military to protect us. But out of those things, I mean, I lived through four wars, I think. Uh, and I, I know I, there is no one Israeli person who do, doesn't know somebody who died in like 
a terrorist attack or a bombing, a school bus to my school exploded when I was 16. Um, crazy, insane things that people shouldn't really have to deal with. But I think all those things kind of brought us to um, having this mentality of everything can end tomorrow. <laughs> the world can end, literally the world can end tomorrow. So we might as well not stress the little things, have, you know, the Israeli chutzpah of, of, of saying what we think, um, being extra warm, being extra aggressive, um, all those qualities that are sometimes problematic, but there are a lot of times helpful, especially in business, um, to really put things um, uh, into, into the works and to, to progress ideas and, and, and new concepts and new things and, and inventions. So in that regard, Israel is very unique. Um, and, and the military, you're right, women are serving uh, um, also in the military, but women are serving two years and men are serving three years. Why is that? I don't know. I mean, I, I do, but I don't agree with. Um, now there is like a very small amount of, of female pilots in the military. Um, people are saying, are, are questioning whether women should be in fighting combat positions or not. Um, so it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that women are in the military and that gives us an edge and an, advance, an, an advantage over other countries maybe, um, but it's still far uh, from from being equal. I, I can't say from my personal experience, I was in the intelligence unit and as an 18 year old to be given a lot of power, uh, a lot of responsibility. Uh, that's where I first learned about space because intelligence uses satellites uh, for um, grabbing information from the air uh, about stuff. Uh, that I cannot say. By the way, nobody, even not my parents, know what I did in the military. Uh, it will kind of die with me. But um, but that gave me a lot. I mean, I was too shy to even ask for someone on the phone before I got into the military. And then I started to talk to like very, very high ranked um, uh, people in the military and outside of it. Uh, and it kind of gave me the confidence. It kind of gives you a, a growing up boost. Uh, and it also gives you um, a clean slate. People from all across the board of financial uh, situations go to the military, they wear the same thing, they get the same very, very basic salary. If you don't have a home, you can live in the base uh, and it kind of gives you a fresh start in life. I mean, a lot of, you can see it in, in the United States when it's not mandatory, a lot of people that are struggling choose to go to the military. Uh, here, since it's mandatory, everything, the, the, the slate is swiped clean, you can't, you're not, richer or poorer than anyone else around you. Uh, and I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, I think that's something that we is. can really take. Uh, th there's also the notion now that may, uh, research proved that if you give citizens a very, very small basic amount of money every month um, and, and to just allow them to survive, uh, to, to, to eat and to have a roof above their heads, that would cost less than to fund homeless shelters and things like that. Yes, and that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, so I think it's an interesting concept. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, uh, we, I don't want to get into military and all, all that uh, political and yeah. other things, yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. but I think it's a great learning experience. And I, I, I love the fact that they, that they do that. And, and it still has room for improvement. And, and I guess I, I would get into it. I, I think that all, all military on our earth should be uh, put into some kind of a social service or uh, some kind of other service that instead of us fighting against each other, we're all homo sapiens and uh, earthlings and so I, I would like us to resolve our issues between each other and drop the borders and work together as a planet um, to to really create better futures until and use that money the, the enormous amount of monies for better things for to go into space to cleaning up our environment to cleaning up our infrastructures and built environments I think that would be great but that's a whole nother ball yep. of wax and topic <laughs> that we can get into. But that really brings me to my hardest and uh, question for you today. Mm -hmm. It's the burning question, WTF. And it's not the swear word, although we've been all doing it this year, swearing and pulling out our hair. It's the question, what's 
the future? I think what's the future needs an S at the end. What's the futures? There are many, many options. Um, I think that in my personal uh, opinion, the thing that I hate the most about being human is the fact that I will not necessarily be able to see it. Not necessarily, maybe I will, I don't know with certain advances. Um, I think, um, I, I think things are going to change very, very rapidly. Uh, we are definitely going to become interplanetary species in the next decade or less. Um, I think once that happens, once the control over decisions like that leaves governments and becomes uh, uh, in the hands of, of corporations, of private people, um, I think a lot of power dynamics is going to, to, to shift. <laughs> Um, women may get more um, um, higher in the in the politics and and and, and uh, leadership uh, in, in companies and in countries. Uh, and, and by the way, it's a whole conversation of nature versus nurture. I don't necessarily think that women are better. I think that's just the way we are brought up and, and things that happen that that uh, make a difference between uh, perspectives like that. But. I'm, I'm very excited. I think we are really in a time of, of growing pains. Uh, it is really hard, but I think it is, that's the only way to go. I mean, I was waiting for something like this to happen. Uh, um, it was obvious to me that something really big has to change in order for things to become better. I don't think the earth is going to collapse <laughs> in, in 50 years. I do think we really have to understand that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a danger and we have to completely change our mindset in terms of sustainability. Uh, um, but I, I, can, I can answer this question, I think, for, for an hour, um, trying to kind of condense my, my thoughts into something coherent. But um, I, I really think that our future is going to have, on the one hand, a lot more technology and AI and things like that. On the other hand, a newfound appreciation from human psychology, human creativity, um, human things that for now at least machines can't really replace. So I wouldn't be scared of that. Um, the World Economic Forum says uh, um, that uh, the majority of jobs we have today are going to be obsolete, but about um, two or three times as many new jobs are going to form. So it's really a matter of perspective. Um, things are going to change. You can choose to cry about it or you can choose to get really, really, really excited about it uh, and kind of morph yourself or, or, or evolve yourself with it, with that um, change. So, so for anyone who's, who's listening, I, I think that the future is really, really interesting and exciting and, and new. Um, and, and, and yeah, I think we have all the resources, um, to, to, do, to do that. So is there any project or something special you're working on or that's coming that you would like to share with us or tell us about that, uh, something exciting or that, that you're kind of working on that you, or you want to you know, tell us what's next from your compound? so many things and so many things I'm under NDA that I can't share at the moment, which is very, very sad. Um, right now, I am uh, I have a new position on as a member of board of advisors on a new venture capital um, that is a joint uh, um, uh, mission of Israel and the Emirates, uh, which is interesting. Um, it's an interesting uh, combination. And the uh, goal of this VC is to um, uh, invest in space uh, startups that have, they, those startups have to have an earthly implication uh, even before that space thing. And that's very, very interesting to me. Uh, it's something that uh, I'm happy to share. There's not really uh, anything that people can really see yet about it, but that's something that is very, very new and exciting for me personally. Um, a lot of projects that I'm doing are very, very exciting, but unfortunately I can't really share it. Um, 
my time now is really shifting from working. I always say that as an architect, I work with, about, on projects with gravity and without gravity. And the shift is going more towards the without gravity part and the innovation and imagining and, and, and um, uh, those aspects. So I'm very, very excited uh, about those things. Uh, I, I will be happy to share when, when the time is right. I really feel that there's um, no pressure. I just yeah. wanted to know if there was something in your mind that, that you wanted to share with us. Um, but I actually have three last questions for you mm -hmm. before we wrap up. Um, and, and that is a, a sustainable takeaway for our listeners, something that they could apply or put into their lives. If there was one message that you could depart to, the, to, to my listeners that had the power to change their life, what would it be your message? I don't know if it's the best one, but it's the first thing that comes to my mind. You don't have to choose um, if you either recycle or you are pro equality, or if you are um, making money and you want to help the people that are less, less fortunate. I think you can, and that's the big challenge I think of our times is that to understand that kind of like the SDGs, there are so many points where we should all focus on all those points in some way or another. It's okay to have something that is more close to our hearts or not, but I think that it's time for a kind of an awakening uh, and, and to really understand that everything that we do have an impact, it's, we can't allow ourselves to turn a blind eye on anything. Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, um, equality, uh, the, the, the climate change, we, we don't have that privilege anymore to, to, to say, doesn't concern me, I'm going to focus on my narrow thing. I mean, the same way that you can be a nice person and recycle, you can, you can do all those things. So I think that's, that's the big, big message. Great. What should young innovators in architecture or in the space field be thinking about uh, if they're looking for ways to make real big impacts? I think that that's, that's an interesting question. I think what worked for me is to really discover honestly what you're good at and what you love to do and combine it with what you're passionate about. It's not necessarily the same thing. Uh, I think that's the secret recipe of, of um, uh, startups or of, of inventions to just really do something that you know you're good at, don't, don't go in directions that maybe, I mean, be humble to know that maybe there are people that are better than you in something, um, but understand what you're good at, combine it what you're passionate about, and really um, start to talk to people about it. You can be the most talented human in the world, but if you sit in a dark room and nobody knows about your talents and about your dreams, nothing is going to happen and you're not gonna have uh, impact. So I think in some ways to have connections, those human connections, that network, the global network that people should really take advantage of the time we're living in to have a bigger global network. Um, that's something that uh, I think people should really, really focus on if they have big dreams and, and um, desire to, to make an impact. Great. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? So many things. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I think, I, I don't know if, if I've known things from the start. Uh, w when is that start? I don't think maybe in my personal growth as a human, I would know, I would have known what to do with that information. Um, you know what I mean? I, I think, I think that it's Thanks. usually the journey, you know, it's really about the journey that you learn. But like, for me, example, uh, on mm -hmm. how I would answer that is I'd say, boy, I wish I would have realized sooner and begun sooner. Um, uh, if I would have started sooner, the impact, the amount of change, the things uh, that I could have done would be enormous. And that's kind of my biggest wish. But a, a lot of people I really, really say they love the journey you know that that process of journey yeah, and discovery I mean, I, is something I, I really do think that the journey is is 
is the main thing because if I started earlier, maybe I wasn't as resilient as a person to kind of be confident enough to, to, to go. Uh, I mean, I lost a lot of work because I talked about what I believe in. I didn't, uh, I faced a lot of um, 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 men offering me jobs in terms of dates and things like that. I mean, I think that those things, if, if I would start to do everything that I do earlier, maybe I would not have the strong backbone that I have today. So I really do think that all in good time is kind of the, 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 the slogan here because there is no time that is too late to do something. I think the journey is really, really important, really understanding where you are in it. Um, I really think that a lot of things that I'm doing now, I wouldn't have been able to do if I started earlier. Obviously, I would love to have as much time as possible to do everything I do and, and to have the most connections, but I really think that those things are evolving with you. And, and it's really to understand where you are as a human, where you are in relation to everyone around you and to the world around you and to the time that we're living in. I think those realizations came to me uh, uh, in, in the right time, uh, I think. Uh, and it doesn't mean that I just woke up one day with them. I studied and I learned. And, then, and the first time that I, I, I was accepted to a space accelerator, for eight days with people from NASA. I had no idea about how to even talk about space and I didn't know the terminology. And every night I didn't sleep and I just read really, really, really boring articles just to have that terminology um, to, to be able to carry on conversations during the day. So I worked really, really hard for this, um, but I really do think that things come to you in, in, in the right time in your personal uh, development and it's never too late to, to, to go about those things. Mika, it's been, <laughs> thank you, Mika. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been so exciting and nice to, to speak with you. We could really like talk for life. hours yeah. because there's so many more things we could do. Unless you have something else you'd like to share or tell me or ask me, I'm done. I appreciate your time and, and I hope we can catch up again in a year and, and get an update on, on how you're of doing. Of course. Of course, I would love that. Yeah, I mean, I feel that every single topic out of, out of these things, we can really dive deeper and, and, and talk for hours. So uh, to be cognizant of our, our listeners time also, I think maybe uh, um, uh, this is a lot uh, enough food for thought uh, for now. But yeah, I would definitely love to, to continue this conversation. And thank you again for having me. Uh, it's, it's been uh, a, a true uh, pleasure an honor to, to speak to you about these topics. Thank you so much, Mika. And we'll talk to you again very soon. Have a wonderful holiday season, new year, uh, happy Hanukkah. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.